Egypt, North Africa. This is wild. The Nile River, a freshwater biome. Here we go. This is Journey into Wild Egypt, the Nile River. Egypt is an ancient land. It's filled with wonder. When we arrived in Egypt, I could hardly contain my excitement. I've always wanted to go to Egypt. It's just one of those places you gotta see. Here in Egypt, everything depends on the Nile. The most important thing in all of Egypt is the Nile River. Great Egyptian cities grew along the Nile. If you look at a map, you would imagine that the Nile River flows from north to south. But actually, because of the country's topography, it flows from south to north. Fun fact, most Egyptians live by the Nile. Because most of the country is desert. Along the Nile River, it's nice and green. The Nile provided food, water, soil, and transportation. It used to be that the Nile River would flood about the same time every year. All the crops got water, and they didn't even have to water them. But now, the river flooding is being controlled by the Aswan Dam. The river is everything to Egyptians. My favorite place in Egypt is a city called Luxor. When people think about Egypt, they often think about Cairo. But that's actually not where the center of the civilization was. It was here in Luxor. We rented a house right in a farm village. We're staying in a newly built Egyptian house and it's perfectly equipped for our family of six. It has a living room, a dining room, a kitchen, two bedrooms, two bathrooms, and a big garden. Luxor was where the palaces were and where many of the famous kings and queens were buried. Luxor used to be called Thebes. Thebes became a city around 1300 BC. It was built because an Egyptian king built a beautiful temple for the god Amon. He was believed to be the king of the gods. Today it's called the Temple of Luxor, and now it lies in ruins. Luxor was a home for many of the pharaohs. They built an avenue of sphinxes to connect this temple to another great temple, the Temple of Karnak. The Temple of Karnak was more like a village. It had temples, chapels, and other community spaces. This place is enormous. You spend the entire day walking around and looking at these ancient ruins. Some of them are 4,000 years old. This was the single largest religious site in the entire world. You can visit ancient tombs in the Valley of the Nobles, the Valley of the Queens, and the Valley of the Kings. In modern Arabic, the word Luxor translates into the palaces, and of course it reminds us of the word luxury. It's impossible to overstate the importance of Karnak and Luxor. This is where King Tut, Seti I, and Ramses II ruled over Egypt. From both the Jewish Torah and the Christian Bible, we know the story of the ancient Israelites being here in Egypt, and Moses coming to free them. This palace is likely where Moses would have confronted Ramses II. At Karnak, the pharaohs ruled in unity with their gods. Pharaoh was the ultimate middleman. He was the intermediary between the gods and the Egyptian people. Karnak was a temple to the Egyptian god Amon-Ra. Amon-Ra! He was a sun god, and he was a god the Egyptians dare not offend. Over 80,000 servants would have served Amon-Ra here at Karnak Temple. Can you imagine? The Egyptians believed that the east side of the Nile River was the land of the living, and the west side of the Nile was the land of the dead. So the east side is where the temples and the palaces were, and the west side is where they buried the deceased. The Egyptians built massive monuments to their pharaohs and underground mausoleums too. In Egypt's new kingdom, the valley was the royal burial ground. The Valley of the Kings is where they found the tomb of King Tut. These are pharaohs we've all heard of. 
As you can imagine, the king's tombs are the most exquisite. They are simply breathtaking. The Egyptians prepared their pharaohs elaborately for the afterlife. They painted artwork on all the walls. And they've excavated many of the tombs. The ancient Egyptians had so many stories. You can visit the tombs by walking into narrow tunnels to go into the inside. Deeper, deeper, deeper into the mountain. In many of the tombs, the paint is still there. Isn't that amazing? There, you can find some sarcophagi. It's a box-like shape where the dead were buried. They believe that when someone dies, they're going on to the next world. Tombs are where they bury the dead. But it's much, much bigger than a coffin, and it has multiple layers. When someone died, they leave their heart against the feather. If their heart was light, it means they did good deeds. But if their heart was heavy, uh-oh, bad news. Don't go to the underworld and be eaten. Scary. The feather came from the goddess of truth and justice. The dead were buried with a lot of valuable items, things they thought they might need in the afterlife. They wanted their pharaohs to continue in the afterlife with their food, their servants, all the things that made them comfortable in this life. When someone died, they took out their heart and their organs. They put each organ in a separate jar. The jars were called canopic jars, and the jars were buried along with the mummy. Today, Luxor and the valleys of the kings, the queens, and the nobles are a world heritage site. It's somewhere every family should explore. Luxor is set on two sides of the Nile. The West Bank is where a lot of the tombs are and where people live today. The East Bank has many of the museums and temples. You have to move between the East and the West Banks of the Nile River. The bridge is far away, it's not easy to get over. The easiest way to get from one side to the other is by a taxi boat. Water taxis are everywhere across the banks of the Nile. It's just a matter of going down there, talking to the driver, negotiating your price, and getting on board. And it was super cheap. It was like three, four dollars a trip for the entire family on a private water taxi. We all loved being on the water taxis. When you're on a boat, you feel a part of the river in a different way. And the water taxis, it's what locals do. So when we were taking a water taxi, we felt like we were locals. Here in Egypt, it's sugarcane season. It's sugarcane season, and that means the farmers are harvesting sugarcane. Egypt has this thriving sugarcane industry. This year alone, they're gonna produce 850,000 tons of sugar. So at this time of year, the Egyptian factories are working 24 hours a day for 140 days straight just to get in the sugarcane harvest. Everywhere we turned, we saw trucks loaded with sugar cane. There's so much sugar cane during harvest season. Kids are just eating it everywhere. When you grind sugar cane into a juice, it's called a sop. It's sugar juice. It's delicious. I wonder if the ancient Egyptians liked it. One of my great joys in traveling is introducing kids to new languages and then linking that back to world history. In Egypt, the language is Arabic. But the language of ancient Egyptians was hieroglyphics. The ancient Egyptians had their own way of writing. The oldest hieroglyphics we know of were created 5,000 years ago. In all the ancient tombs of Egypt, we found beautiful hieroglyphics. When you look at hieroglyphics, you see little pictures, and you would imagine that each one of those pictures represents the thing that it looks like, like a bird or a feather, but that's actually not true. Each of those little symbols represents a sound, much like a letter in the English alphabet. Hieroglyphics are small pictures, and each picture means a different sound. A sound for words. Problem is, no one knew what the pictures meant until they found the Rosetta Stone. They know a lot about hieroglyphics because of the Rosetta Stone. 
the Rosetta Stone was found near the mouth of the Nile River. In 1799, French soldiers were repairing a fort near Rashid, and as they were digging around, they found the Rosetta Stone. The Rosetta Stone had three languages on it that unlocked hieroglyphics and ancient Egyptian language. The Rosetta Stone had three different languages on it. The two languages they understood, but the third one, hieroglyphics, no go. They had no idea what it said. Because it was the story in two languages, it must be the same story in hieroglyphics. This was huge. And they could see that the words and the stories were the same. Since all the stories were the same, they could decode the hieroglyphics. Suddenly, the whole language was unlocked. Now we know a lot about ancient Egyptians. There's no spaces between words, no punctuation at all. Plus, hieroglyphics can be read left to right, right to left, up, down, vertically, horizontally. It's like a crossword puzzle. Because no one today has ever heard the language of hieroglyphics being spoken, we have no idea what it sounded like. Does it sound like Arabic or French or German or Chinese? We will never know. Seeing ancient hieroglyphics on tombs was awe-inspiring. We've never seen anything like it in the world. Sunset over the Nile River is just magical. We took a boat called the Felucca along the Nile. Feluccas have been integral to Egyptian culture for a millennia. When the sun is setting, people love to get on a felucca. This is a special boat in Egypt. It's actually a small sailboat with a big sail. Feluccas were first created for trade on the Red Sea. I love that feluccas are powered by wind energy. This doesn't create any pollution. It's made mostly of wood, it has very little heavy metal, it doesn't even have a motor. At night on the Nile River, there's hundreds of feluccas taking a sunset sail. When you're on a felucca, you feel like you've gone back in time. This was how the world was meant to be explored. They used to take these boats from Cairo all the way to Luxor. That's a journey of over five days. Being on a felucca is about patience and leisure. It's about hospitality. Luxor was a home for many of the pharaohs, and most of them are buried on the West Bank. We went to the temple of Hatshepsut. Hatshepsut? Hatshep? Hatshep? I don't know. <laughs> when we describe ancient Egyptian history, we're talking about the Old Kingdom, the Middle Kingdom, and the New Kingdom. In between these kingdoms were periods of relative chaos. They are called intermediate periods. She was a queen in the New Kingdom. You have to take a golf cart to get in there. Hide in mind. Hatshepsut built a temple for herself and also for the god Amon. For ancient Egyptians, temples were places for the gods to literally come and dwell, to live in them. This is a masterpiece of ancient architecture. The temple is built up against a cliff face. The cliffs tower over the temple. It's hewn right into the edge of the rock. It's intentional. It's on purpose. It's about permanence. Hatshepsut was saying, I'm here to stay. You're never going to forget me. It's about pageantry. It's about procession. This is ancient Egypt. Hatshepsut was married to King Tutmos II. And when he died, she became the queen regent because her son was too young to rule. She was so powerful. She created an entire mythology around her own birth and she imagined that an oracle had predicted her reign. This lady was no joke. She wasn't just a queen, she was a king. She was the pharaoh. She ruled Egypt for two decades. She commissioned many temples and sculptures. Hatshepsut saw herself as more than a queen. She was the king. Even the traditional headcloth that she wore had the pharaohic cobra on it. This lady believed herself to be the rightful king of Egypt. All the words in ancient Egypt related to being a king or a pharaoh were male. There wasn't even a word for queen in their language. 
The words are literally king's wife or king's mother. There isn't even a word for queen. The temple was a must-see for us. It was incredible. We didn't know much about Egyptian food when we came to Egypt, but we've been to Cyprus and Turkey and Israel. These are all countries in the Middle East. So we figured the food would probably be a little bit the same, and it was. When I grow up, I want to be a chef. When I'm traveling to different countries, I always study the food. One of my favorite things in Egypt are the falafels. I'm a flexitarian, and I love a good vegetarian meal. So when you're talking chickpea falafels, I'm there. Reagan and I are all about the vegetarian food, so Egyptian food is fantastic. The falafels are next level. Falafels are made of chickpeas, and here they also add coriander. Falafels, hummus, tahini. There's also a lot of delicious salads and soups. There's not many places in the world where I enjoy a hole-in-the-wall, street food, sit-down spot, but in Egypt, yes. The Nile is arguably the longest river in the world. For centuries, they couldn't find the source of it. It was a mystery where the Nile started. In Greek and Roman artwork, the Nile River is actually portrayed as a god with no face. In ancient Egyptian times, most people lived in mud houses. Even today, 95% of the population here lives right by the Nile River. It makes sense, humans need water to survive. Think about all the ways you use water in a given day. Because the Egyptians used the Nile for everything, it seems like polluting it would be unthinkable. Wouldn't it make sense if this precious commodity was protected? But today, there's so many people and so much pollution. The sad truth is that four and a half million tons of pollutants are pumped into the Nile River every year. So many places that we went in Egypt, we saw trash lining the Nile River. It's industrial waste, agricultural waste, sewage, pollutants, it's trash, it's all in the Nile. I think we can do better. We have to protect the rivers of our world. It's important for us as humans and also for animals. Polluting the Nile River has detrimental consequences. Loss of biodiversity, diseases, other issues. I feel like as a mom, it's my job to teach my kids to protect the waters, the rivers, and the ecosystems. It's the future of their lives. The Nile's beautiful. Sadly, so many people put trash in the river. It makes the river stinky and yuck. It's important for children to see pollution in its big, ugly, raw form. They need to get a vision for how they could be a part of the solution and not the problem. We should never, ever throw our trash in a river or a sea. What's my job as a child in protecting our world's rivers? What would happen if the 10 countries who depended on the Nile River didn't have it anymore? I'm guessing that our kids will probably never forget the Nile River and the problem of its pollution. There used to be a lot of freshwater crocodiles in the Nile River. Today, there's not many Nile River crocodiles, but throughout history, there have been. In Egypt, you hear stories about people buying baby crocodiles from crocodile farms and then raising them at home in their bathtubs. Eventually, the crocodile gets too big, and it's released back into the Nile. Imagine doing your laundry there by the Nile River, and a crocodile spots you. Bad news. People swim in the Nile. They wash their clothes. They drink from it. We can't have the crocodiles all throughout the river. Today, the crocodiles are behind the wall of the dam. They try to make sure they don't get out. But they do. Each year, over 200 deaths happen along the Nile River in Egypt because of the Nile crocodile. Let's talk about papyrus. Papyrus was very important in ancient Egypt. The papyrus plant is cultivated in the Nile River. 
It's an aquatic plant that grows in the shallow water among the reeds. The ancient Egyptians used the stem of the papyrus to make many things. But the most important thing they made out of papyrus was paper. Here we make papyrus paper, the papyrus plant, it's water plant, it used to grow in the Nile. The flower looks like the sunrise, the stem like the pyramid shape, see? Triangle. That's why ancient time they believe it's a holy plant, belong to the sun god. How we make paper out of this plant, we cut the stem of the papyrus as long as we want. Then we take the green part out like this, like rhubarb, if you know rhubarb. The inner part, which we use it to make the paper, we cut it as a slices like that. See, this is easy to break. Yeah. But we roll it to take the juice out, like that. Then it became strong and flexible because it has juice now. See, before, just easy to break. After, very strong. When we put it into the water for three days, then we start after that in three days' time, then it became sticky, if you're feeling. Glue, natural glue from the plant itself. Oh my See? gosh. Whoa. Yeah. That, that, cellulose, that's, it has cellulose on it. That's awesome. That feels really good. Yes. Yeah. Then after that, we start to make the slices here, horizontal layers and vertical layers like that. See? We finish all horizontal, so it's not waved, just horizontal. We finish all horizontal, then we make the vertical. Till we finish them all, we cover them, we press them for a week. Ancient time, they have no press using two blocks of stones in state to press them. One week down this press, they stick together because of the natural glue, then you would have the piece of paper like that, see? Oh, wow. This is the original papyrus, very strong. Roll it, pull it, it doesn't break. Wash it, no problem, see? <gasps> see? This is what? the genuine. So this is the first wearlet paper before the Chinese. Egyptians made the first wearlet paper made so out cool. of this plant, you know? This is so cool, paper. Something we use every day. Here it is, right where it started along the Nile River. It was so fascinating to learn how they made it. When we think of Egypt, we often think of mummies, right? The ancient Egyptians used to mummify everything. Crocodiles, cats, even persons. We went to the Mummification Museum in Luxor. This museum is dedicated to the art of making mummies. We had so much fun discovering the process of mummification here in Egypt. It might be kind of weird or strange, but they had this down to a science. When they're making a mummy, they pull the brains out of the nose. Ew! Some of these mummies were thousands of years old. My favorite part in the Mummification Museum was the crocodile. Can you believe they mummified crocodiles? Can you imagine? Here's this thing that's been dead for a very long time, and here it is, perfectly preserved. I wonder how old this crocodile is. 3,000 years? Wow. The kids were ready to mummify everything, all their toys, just mummify it all. Let's go to Cairo. Cairo is a huge city. Nine and a half million people live here. When we arrived in Cairo, we were just buzzing with anticipation. Cairo is the capital of Egypt. When we went to Cairo, we first took the kids to the Cairo Tower. This is on an island in the middle of the Nile River called Zamalek. So when you go up the Cairo Tower, you get 360 degree views of the whole city. There is an observation deck and a revolving restaurant. This is cool. We're in Zamalek in the heart of Cairo. I wanted to see the pyramids, the Sphinx, the Nile River. It's so helpful for the kids to have a giant perspective of the city from an aerial view before they go and explore it on foot. Just outside of Cairo is the town of Giza where the famous pyramids are. These pyramids are over 3,000 years old. Everyone knows about the Great Pyramids. 
There are actually over a hundred pyramids in Egypt today. Look guys, the pyramids! There are lots of camels, horses, and animals around the pyramids. It's great to explore the pyramids with an Egyptologist. These are special historians who know Egyptian history. Egyptologists are all around the pyramids of Giza. You know, they want you to hire them to take you around the sites so that they can tell you all the ins and outs about what makes this place so special. There's very little signage or historical information around these sites. So either you hire an Egyptologist or you do a bunch of your research before you go. If you don't, you're just flying in the dark. We are at the Giza Pyramids and we are learning so much. When we go to visit these historical sites all around the world, we try to do our research beforehand. We read books, watch videos, and get ourselves ready so that when we're there in person, we know what we're looking at and we understand the history of where it came from. We are climbing around the structure, expecting the stone. These are massive structures. How they built them without modern technology, it's a mystery. The pyramids are a work of art and science. Most people believe that they were built to be the tombs of pharaohs. If these pyramids were built to be the monuments to pharaohs, they definitely thought a lot about themselves. Of course they were built on the west side of the Nile, the land of the dead. But they didn't find bodies in these tombs. Grave robbers are looking for gold, silver, jewelry. The pharaohs were thought to become gods in the afterlife. People have made up many different stories about how these pyramids were built. Some people say they moved the entire stones across the country using only sound. If that's true, that's a technology that no longer exists. Some people think that they used a form of algae or seaweed. They used it to make the stone slippery so it could slide. It's just mind blowing to imagine how they figured out how to do this. The Great Pyramid alone consists of 2.3 million blocks. That's over five tons of limestone. How, just how? When I saw the pyramids, I was like, wow, I'm actually here. I don't know if it was a great idea to build the pyramids on top of the Sahara Desert. If you didn't want grave robbers to rob it, why would you make a flashing neon yellow pyramid that says, hey, come get us, we're, we're loaded with gold. With kids, it's so good to be able to connect these big historical sites to practical hands-on crafts and activities. We built many pyramids out of sugar cubes. Start with nine by nine. Nine sugar cubes on one side, nine sugar cubes on the other. They start to get the sense of how the ancient Egyptians might have begun to imagine this grand monument that they were building. We saw the Great Sphinx. The Great Sphinx of Giza. What is this? Half lion, half man? This is the limestone statue of a reclining sphinx. The sphinx at Giza is missing a nose. It's a mythical creature with the body of a lion and the head of a human. It's bigger than we thought it would be. From Cairo, we drove three hours north to the seaside city of Alexandria, right on the Mediterranean. This city was founded by Alexander the Great. It rivaled ancient cities like Athens and Rome. The city of Alexandria is pretty run down these days, and it's really not very interesting, except for one very important place. Here, they founded one of the most incredible libraries in the ancient world. The Library of Alexandria. At the time, this was the greatest accumulation of human knowledge in history. The Library of Alexandria is thought to be compiled in the 3rd century BC. Historians think that there were over 40,000 papyrus scrolls in this library. Because of this library, the reputation of the city grew and people from all around the world came to study here. 
It was burned many times in its thousand year history, but people think that the first person to have burned it was Julius Caesar. Now that guy was a rascal. Today, the library has been rebuilt and it's the pride and joy of Alexandria. We completed our journey from Upper Egypt to Lower Egypt at the mouth of the Nile. We made it to the mouth of the Nile River. This is where the Nile ends. You have to see this. This is where the mighty Nile takes its final bow and empties into the Mediterranean Sea. Look how big it is. We're right in the heart of the Delta. A Delta is usually found at the end of a big river. The Nile River flows through 10 different countries. It flows through Upper Egypt, through the whole country, and empties into the Mediterranean Sea. One of the greatest rivers in the world. This is where the Nile ends. The Nile River is a wonder of the world. It was an epic family experience to learn about this biome. In Egypt, we've seen Luxor's palaces, temples, and tombs. We explored the animals of the country and learned to make papyrus. We discovered the mummies and the pharaohs of ancient times. We studied the problem of pollution around the Nile. We learned about Cairo and the Great Pyramids. And finally, we explored the library at Alexandria and the mouth of the Nile River. What a journey. Overall, I feel that Egypt is a fascinating place and every kid should come here. What an amazing experience we had in Egypt. This was Journey into Wild Egypt, the Nile River. <laughs>